you talked a little bit previously about um, John Sajaka and um, you'd mentioned that uh, you'd had the opportunity to uh, look at some of the, the files that he had and um, perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about that? Certainly. Um, early in uh, 1983 and 1984, I had the opportunity, actually, no one, uh, uh, I got to tell you this right at the beginning, that nobody really knows where John Sajaka came from because he just showed up one day and uh, it seemed like John Sajak and I were friends immediately. And uh, as I got to know John Sajak just a little bit more, he used to come around and he used to, uh, he always carried this, uh, this pair of horseshoes with him and he was always playing with these horseshoes and always trying to get me to unlock the horseshoes, but of course I wasn't coordinated enough to use those horseshoes. But um, he, uh, was a strange character and like when we were talking in the restaurant earlier tonight about this, um, Rhonda did, my wife didn't, didn't care for just two people in my life and one of those, those two people were, one was John Sajak and the other was Ron Cole. And, and why I have no idea, she just didn't like these two individuals so she never she was around during certain things, but not, not all the time. But uh, one night I was called on the telephone by John Sajak and I was told to go to a certain address in Canoga Park. And so I, I just got in the car and went there. And I'm going to tell you all something. I walked into what looked like a normal building, but when I got inside this building, um, I'd never seen like anything like that inside because all along the top of the building on the upper rows was it seemed like invention after invention after invention after invention and it went on and on and on for about a thousand feet and uh, what was on that shelf were things like magnets that picked up gold coins Gasoline that was made from plants, green, which he called green gasoline. Uh, a real working model of a PAP engine. Uh, coils that I've never seen that were conical shaped, almost like a Tesla coil, but m much steeper angles than that, which were all resonant at a certain frequency. And uh, I paid very close attention to one thing when I walked in there and I said, John, what's that over there on the wall? And he, he said, oh. And I walked over to the wall and now I'm telling you for a thousand feet there was this chart and it was basically laid out like this here. And uh, on the chart he said that, and it, and it was had all these little lines like this on the chart. But it was huge. It was a thousand, almost a thousand feet long. Because it was quite a big building. They were uh, producing uh, water gasoline. Where, uh, where they, I didn't, didn't really understand what they were doing because I wasn't in the gas business but I can tell you that they had a water fuel where you could actually take a garden hose and once they dumped the catalyst in the tank you could just put the garden hose in there and fire up the truck and it was gone full tank of gasoline and uh, was this the and gas one or the it was called anafuel anafuel and was it was actually gasoline or was it yeah just it was actually it was actually yeah. gasoline it smelled like gasoline and had the same color as gasoline, and this plant was producing a lot of fuel. This was the one where they used the styrofoam? Yes. It was a styrofoam gasoline. Of course, I never knew what the, uh, what the chemical composition of this was, but 
but I can tell you this, when he gave the demonstrations, he would take just a little bit of the liquid, which was in the little bottle, and uh, he would uh, put some nap, what they call nap, he'd put a little bit of nap, and he'd add the catalyst to the nap, and then the rest was water. So, so if the jar was this, say this high, just the mixture that they put in it was about this high, and then the rest was water, mm -hmm. and it was gasoline. He would take that, and they had a Briggs and Stratton engine there with an empty tank, and he would dump that in the tank, and he'd turn the choke on, give the thing a pull, and it'd fire right up. And when I asked, you know, how can you run that engine in here? He says, because, because this gasoline takes the CO2 out of the air and pulls it down and it falls down to the ground. Hmm. So whatever the engine was doing, it was coming out clean, burning. There was no oil, there was no smoke, there was no smell. So anyway, back, I'm gonna backtrack a little bit here. I started asking John, what is this chart? And he said, well, go over there and look. And so I, I went over there and it showed where time started on our time scale. And then it went on and on and on and it got up into somewhere in here and 2001 was about here. Or 2000. And there were little pictures underneath the chart. And uh, I know that most people are going to find this hard to believe, but all along this chart it said who the presidents were, whether they were assassinated or not assassinated, what the year was going to bring as far as, as food for the world. And, you know, when it got up into, because I was in 84, I was back here somewhere. And when I got up here, it, uh, it said that uh, the world was in a chaotic condition, basically, at 2000. And it showed uh, war and war and war and war and, and more war. It also showed that uh, it named the presidents by name. It, it showed Reagan. It showed Carter, it showed Reagan, it, it, it showed George Bush Sr. And after that it showed Clinton, it said the Clinton years, right in here somewhere. And uh, now how, how they knew, I was back here, how they knew even who the presidents were was a mystery to me. And when I asked John Sajaka that question, he says, we know. Hmm. We know who's going to be the president. And right around in here, he said, it showed a little picture and it showed two little towers. Hmm. And it showed them on fire. And uh, I never put two and two together because I was never allowed while I was at the Sajaka lab to take a photograph of this, but it showed war. It showed war from from here on all the way to the end, and it said that time it ended here for us. And if you if you take this scale, if this is 1984 and you just look at this from here to here, this must be 2036 or 2034 or something. Mm -hmm. But it said it ended there, and it ended in disaster. There's, there's nothing, there, nothing went on past that. And uh, I never really paid attention to after this, but I thought it kind of funny when it said, you know, here's Reagan, and then Bush was gonna be the next president. And I said, how do you know that? I kept saying that to him, and he says, we know who all the presidents are going to be from here on up. And uh, at that point in time, he says, well, just take take all the time you want and, and look at the chart. He said, but that's all I'm going to answer. 
and that's all he did answer. He wouldn't he wouldn't go any further than that. But he said that they knew what the future held all the way to a certain date. And so it was easy to make the chart. They could go forward, they could go backwards. And uh, as I got to know John Sajaka a little bit more, John Sajaka started to open up and one day came over with a notebook, which you, you see many notebooks around the table here. And he said, uh, he said, come here, I want to show you something. And I started to look through the notebooks like this. And I said, well, I've never seen anything like this. You know, it talked about ESP machines. It talked about aluminum car air batteries. It talked about things that should have happened. And uh, I said, well, gee, can I copy that and study it? And he says, you got one out. He says, do you have a copy machine that's capable of copying what I have? And I said, no. And he said to me, he says, well, let me tell you what to do, John. He says, you got that little machine out there right now, so you can copy a couple pages out of this book. It's great, copying the pages. And then I, I studied them at night, and they were talking about uh, things that were done in the 1800s in this one, uh, articles and things like that, and uh, time and uh, uh, decomposing rocks for transmutation and things like this. Most of this stuff was... He says, well, let me tell you how to do it. He says, they're running a special on copy machines right now. Just call, call, call up and get one, and the salesman will bring you out, and he'll let you keep it for a night. He says, and he's... And, 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 and I mean, as funny as that may seem to everybody, you know, we're, we're talking about a guy here that could throw a cart out to a highway patrol officer and tell him to get the hell out of here. And the guy wouldn't even give him a second look. He'd just get out of there as quickly as he could get out of there. And uh, he said, just get that copy machine and I'll be over here with about five or six books. Well, when he got over there, when he got over to the shop, the books were like this thick, each book. I said, how the heck am I going to cut? I said, you got over like 20, 250,000 copies here. He says, don't worry about it, John. Just start copying. So I got all day. And so I started taking things out of his book and running them through the machine. And uh, what was funny, uh, it was a newer IBM machine that they were trying to sell to small businesses. And I got through about two of these books, and the machine quit. And he says, I says, oh, gee, i got to pay for this machine now. He goes, don't worry about that, John. Just call him up and tell him that it quit. And then you couldn't evaluate it. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, i got got 100,000 copies on a machine, you know, or 200,000 copies, and the machine breaks. Of course the machine breaks, right? <laughs> so... So this was one of the, the funnier moments with Sajeka. And uh, he, he said, just call the guy in the morning and tell him to bring over another machine because this one broke down. And so I called the guy up and he says, what do you mean it broke down? We haven't had any problem with these machines. I said, well, this one quit while I was copying. You know, I did, I, myself, I never had a copy machine. I had one of those little... Uh, what you would call the, the dry transfer paper where they, they came out on the rolls, right? And it, it looked like chicken scratch when it came out. And uh, I called this uh, IBM guy up and he came right out and he says, he goes, you didn't tell me that uh, you're going to run 100,000 copies or 200,000 <laughs> copies through this darn machine. You know, and I said, well, the machine shouldn't fail. Right? It's only, a, you know, 10 or 15 reams of paper that I went through. <laughs> so, so he says, so Sajeka showed up, and he said to the IBM guy, he says, well, just bring another machine. What do you care? He said, <laughs> he said, you're sampling the machine, you know, 
a company can't buy a machine that doesn't work or breaks after so many copies. And so, so the guy left, he, the guy went and got another machine and he came back and he left another machine. <laughs> and of course that machine quit too. You know, but, and I copied what I could here. You know, and these are the Sajenko files that he had in Chatsworth, California. These are all files from John Sajenko. And, uh, I mean, you know, you just don't start copying, you know, and start getting books this thick, you know, uh, that, without breaking the machine. So I started copying all I could copy, and I started studying these books at night, and I've come to realize that our physical science, as we know it in electro electronics and electricity and everything, is just totally backwards. And uh, that other projects were going on, and that they had all this information, you know, so it kind of makes somebody wonder, uh, who was this guy, you know? Talking with Johnny about his relationship, he told me that there wasn't anybody that reminded him more of himself than John. And uh, uh, he, I think he just, he really relished the time that he, they were together. And I think it was a case where um, he was very excited that he had met somebody that understood what he was talking about. And uh, of course, John was talking at that time about free energy and of course, uh, my brother was really interested in that, and and of course he saw the first prototypes that Mr. Bedini was making, and he was very impressed. See. But in in true reality, John Sudeikis was John Sudeikis, and he uh, he could demonstrate where physics was wrong in all these things, like uh, and he says. John, he says, you know, the future is going to hold electric cars, he says, but they buried that. And like as an example, Pat, if you'll read that, what's it say there? Aluminum air battery development toward an electric car. But like try to zoom in just a little bit and, and show the battery. And see, it's an unpublished paper because it's like a company demo version and look here I think I drew a portion of it somewhere in one of our things but see it's an aluminum wedge and that wedge mm -mm. goes right down in there and you just drive into the gas station and <laughs> you change the aluminum wedge and away you go for another 300 miles so they already had the electric car they already had it right they had it back now and they knew that it was going to be real important in the future because fuel was going to be a problem because this is like endless war, according to Sudeikis. So, and then the other thing that they knew about was they knew about time. You know, and I, I think you can see that right over there. Yeah. This one? That it's an unpublished... Yeah, I think it says a possibility of experimental study of the properties of time. Can you, can you say that again? The possibility of experimental study of the properties of time by N. A. Kozirev. 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 Yeah, it says. What does it say right up there on the release? Unpublished article, Pulkovo. Something in Russian, <laughs> September 1967. So they already knew about time travel back then. And that's an unpublished. Russian article. Yes, it's which an unpublished nobody has. article. Right. So how so, would they get an unpublished? Right. Russian? How did? How did? Unless they were all together, and and they just thought that they can convert me into doing something. You know, is it working for them? Because John Sajeka had the unique comprehension, and I got to say comprehension of knowing people that could do it, you know, so, so I guess you could say that I was pretty fortunate, like, like in a couple of these things here, 
This one? Like this one here, he's doing transmutations, and these are actually his one? notes. Right here, actually his notes. Renesatorium? Yeah. And, um, and if you flip a couple of pages, Pat, you can say you can see on the on the left hand side it says Ruby Gold. Something to gold. Yes, Ruby to Gold. Ruby to Gold. And Mercury, how to do it? Mercury, tin, metal. Right. Something rubies. Yes. Ruby to Gold. How to make an electrical conductive crystal Ruby to Gold, and 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 we're going to cover that. You know, we're going to cover this uh, in the DVD that we, where we talk about making these crystals in the oven. Okay. But that was the the original. Now, John, I got to say that who's, John, who's, who's writing is this? That's John Sajaka's writing. So wherever he got the information, it's written right there. It says tin makes platinum. Yeah, tin makes platinum. Now, okay, if the what makes mercury something. Yeah, carbon or something. Converts there. to crystal something. Right, so. Uh, and it says all done with a red powder. You know, this was a red powder. So. Being as inquisitive as I was, I had to try it all. So, I mean, I went through these books methodically and I've tried just about everything that John Sajaka said here and and it sure does work because I was able to make sound generating crystals and things like that that uh, as were Ruby here, go, Ruby's is saying that they were growing mites in what year there? 18... 1837 yeah and that they knew all about that and, and as you go oh, through Oh that these, was um Biogenesis. Yeah. Can, can you back up to me? Yeah. Andrew I'm Cross. Gonna, I'm Andrew go Cross. To the other side for a minute. Gen Genesis Akari. Yeah, and I think you're going to find in here. Tom, Tom Bearden has written about him too. Mm -hmm. And the same as the uh, Yuri Fox Miller experiments in San Diego proved that as well. And then Faraday actually went to um, the Royal Society and uh, backed up. The fact that Andrew Cross is making living things, living entities in the lab just by sparking. Yeah. Now, uh, Tony, if you can get the camera over here, and Pat, if you could come to for a second. I don't have my glasses on. Could you read what's? Okay. This is Walter Russell. Okay. And this is a power generator that they want to replace all the generators with, and guess who's going to do it? Right there. Okay, yeah. And it says right there in the correspondence. Dear Walter and Lee. Yeah. I should have written long before this to thank you for all the treasured gifts you have sent me and for the courtesy you extended to the delegations from NORAD and ADC. From NORAD? Yeah. Now, that still, it still comes back to the question who was John Sajaka, and how did he know, and where did he get all this And why stuff? did he keep them all? Yes, and yeah. why was there only a few people that he confided in, and why did he allow me to copy it? And he was really a prodigy, wasn't he? An electrical prodigy, mm -hmm. wasn't he? Yeah, he was from a child. He was brilliant that way. Uh, and, uh, of course, being born on a farm, especially back in the time that he was born in the 30s um, it was all work yeah and no play and uh, so he always was anxious to get away from the farm yeah and um, uh, he he did a lot of things all he could do but fact was that you know he felt like he was just misplaced you know he wanted to be where sort of where the action was and talk to people that were doing things and uh, he had a lot of great ideas, but what, what did he do from an early age that that showed everyone that he was kind of uh, had some affinity for working in the electrical field? Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I remember him talking about this 
is that everybody was uh, wondering, you know, where does ball lightning come from? So he built his own uh, spark gap, and <laughs> he took his mother's vacuum cleaner, and he built an orifice for it. And you could do this today if you build the right spark gap on uh, DC voltage and run that uh, run the stream of air past that spark gap, you will make ball lightning. Because huh. ball, when the lightning is <laughs> electricity is formed, he claimed it would it was separated from the main stream of the voltage. It would like curl up, and it became balls. Little ball lightning, and that was one of the first things he did. And I think he wasn't even ten years old. <laughs> so, but you know, he went to Ames for a while, and I know that he had extremely high IQ. But uh, he was a young man. He was interested in a lot more things in science at that time. Yeah. So, being susceptible, he got into a married situation, and his whole life changed. So, but. When he was a young man, you know, he built a welder using glass plates and tin foil. He built a, a transformer and built uh, a welder for, and Dad used it for years after John left the farm. But he thought, my father thought it was just foolishness, you know. But he built a welder from scratch. And uh, I don't know, it, it was uh, just a few years ago, I think they still had that welder. But... Uh, yeah, he was pretty young when he did that. So, yeah, there was a lot of things that, uh, that be, being the kind of person and the the IQ he had, uh, he was always getting into different problems because, uh, you know, he just wouldn't let something be. He would try to find something way to do it better. So, yeah. so, yeah, and he. I suppose from an early age, I can remember him talking about building his first Tesla coil, and and he was very interested in those things. Uh, uh, of course, in those days, they didn't have, he knew more than what many uh, high school teachers knew, so they had a hard time, you know, instructing him, because he was way ahead of them, so. And uh, I think that was one thing that was pretty frustrating for him. Because uh, he wasn't going to let uh, uh, unanswered problem uh, stay unanswered. So now these these files have been sitting in these books since 1984 on my shelf, and you can tell by the paper. Yeah. But these books are crammed full. Uh, like, why am I in some of these books? Yeah, I saw you over here in this one. Right. Yeah. Where it says whose scalar tuner it was. And if you could pan over here for a minute of who did the scalar tuner. You never, you never hear it. Only Tom Bearden had published that us two did it. But Bedini version of the Dea Ferreto scalar detector. Mm -hmm. So that was Sajeka's file on Bedini. Yes, and there's a few more in these books that he had on me. That one mentioned something about Bedini. And actually, I think if you he even had a, a, I've added some things to these books, you know, to keep safe and things like that, but he had, you know, Baldinelli with the battery chargers, and he had, uh, he had just countless number of, of different articles here on time and space, and in fact he even had Sweet, a paper that nobody's ever seen. Called uh, Great Hair Pet. And it's even signed by by Floyd. Yeah. Right here. Right. 
So how did he get this paper? Because this paper really never was available. It's an agreement between them, what they're going mm -hmm. to do. What they're going to do on the space flux alternator. And it's all written up here. That's unpublished, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That I know of. But it's all here. So. What, the, yeah, what was the ESOP Institute, do you know? I don't know. Yeah. But, I mean, to have stuff like Walter Russell, you know, who wrote all those metaphysical books, right? Where he said, you know, where he showed spirals and things like that. Like, as an example, Walter Russell drew drawings. And I kind of think when we go through the G field generator in one of the, the tapes, that you're going to see that I drew basically the same thing when the G field was running. In fact, yeah. you mentioned that to me, Tony. Yeah. That it looked very similar. But that's actually Walter Russell's writing. And he's got the sun as the center of it. Yeah, he's got the sun as the yeah. center. Right, yeah. exactly. Because without the sun, this cosmic energy doesn't come. We can't get it. Right. Right. So, and... Walter Russell also talks about the fact that, that gravity is very different from what we believe it to be. Yes, you read that. Yeah. Where and thermal the law of thermodynamics is completely different, and it's right in here. So, basically, what I wanted to do was give you an overview of some of the new DVDs coming. Yeah. You know, where we're gonna we're gonna prove out these things and show them to you. Yeah. And uh, you have about ten books on the table, but. We have a few huh. more boxes to go through, Tony. So this is just... This is just starters. This is just a smorgasbord. Yeah. This is just the starters because most of this stuff I just couldn't put into binders. There was some, There's 250,000 pages, I would say. And you, and you read them I all. I burned up three copy machines doing this. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've been through... In my in in the in the time that I knew Sajeka, I have probably built. I have proven out what I needed to prove out to myself, and that's why I moved on to the monopole motor, and that's why I moved on with Ron Cole to the window motor, because I know that energy is not what people think it is. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to me that that you've got all this stuff. Well, I was quite favored by John Sajaka for a while, and then I got him mad <laughs> and, uh, by defying him. And he would always call me up on the phone, or he'd come to me in person, and he'd say, John, you're going to be sorry you did that. And I'd laugh that off and take off. And he'd hit me with something from a distance and I and he'd, and he'd ask me when I come back how'd you feel did you like that and I said I wasn't very good John you know and he did it to me when I went down to visit Tom and, and Pete Kelly and you know he, he told me exactly what he was going to do to me on the phone and I'm going to tell you I'm not going to say it on tape because it was the worst time that I ever had. <laughs> and I'm telling you, when you got to stop every 15 minutes, you guys can figure out what he did. You know, and, 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 the, and the funny thing about it was, when he got mad at you, he had a machine for you. You know, like one example is, he showed me how to construct a device, and he wanted to see if I could do it, and I did it, and he came over at 12 o'clock midnight one night, and he said, let me see. And uh, I went ahead and I built the device. And he says, do you know all the things that you could do with the device? He said, you can change the weather. You can uh, cause sickness. You can cause healing. You can just do whatever you want to do. You know, now he didn't... He gave me a simple set of instructions. And I think that was to more or less save me. You know, to 
because he had one. Mm -hmm. And so one day I was playing with a machine and he was sitting there and I said, well, John, what if I just go get my hands wet? And uh, as Rhonda told you tonight in the restaurant, that I went and got my hands wet and I sprinkled the water on it, right? Mm -hmm. And a storm came out of nowhere and it just was raining, raining, raining to where we had somebody coming. And the guy says, what the hell's going on here? He goes, it's not raining anywhere else. It's just raining here, but it's raining quarter drops. And his windshield wipers wouldn't yes, work. Yeah, his windshield wipers wouldn't work. And he, nothing would work. And, of course, my brother said, uh, how do I stop it? The roof's going to flood. We had a flat roof. Oh, God. And there was a, a retaining wall around the roof. <laughs> and the water was coming in through the air conditioning ducts. And uh, I'll never forget it because we uh, we did some healing. We did a lot of good with the machine. We did a lot of we healed a lot of people with the machine uh, under John Sajaka's instructions, which he seemed to be able to get away with anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an example, we're driving down the highways, doing 95 miles an hour on the highway. Okay. And the highway patrolman comes up behind him and stops him, and he says, this guy's going to waste my time. And he took a card out of his wallet. In fact, Gary told the story today, Tony, too. He took a card out of his wallet, and he threw it at the highway patrol officer, and he says, get out of here. The highway patrol officer picked up the card, looked at the card, threw it back at John Sajaka, John put it back in his wallet, which he carried up here. And he says, now you've wasted my time. And <laughs> just continued to go 90 miles an hour <laughs> the rest of the way. And uh, these are things you don't forget because, for example, uh, he collected stuff on organ generators here. Yeah, I saw that there. Yeah, it, uh, where they're talking about boxes that you sit in and see this is all his writing so he must have went and seen this in operation because I think that's what his, what his job was see like this guy has these are uh, cobalt blue glasses that this guy is wearing hmm why because then you can see the orgon energy, he said. Huh. So, you know, for right now, I think that's what I want to say about John Sajaka, and I think that we'll cover it. We'll cover more about John Sajaka in the upcoming DVDs. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, just a quick question, John, um, before we take a break. Um, how was he funded? Any idea? I can only tell everybody this, that we went out to a restaurant and he made a phone call and I overheard the phone call and he said to the girl that was with him at the time, her name was Nancy, he said, Nancy, bring home a bag of money tonight. And she worked? She worked for a bank. Well, she came home with a bag of money, threw it on the table, I was there having coffee with him, and said, is that enough, John? So, so you don't know whether she pulled it out of her account or whether... Yeah. I have no idea. I know that I've never seen the man work. <laughs> Nancy was a woman that he lived with yeah. in California. She, of course, has died. I heard that. Yeah, yeah you told me. Yeah. Yeah. But... Uh, she was quite, probably about the same age as his oldest daughter, but she had, uh, you know, the intelligence of, and I think it was, the, there was some chemical connection that drew them together. Yeah. And she worked in a bank. Is that right? Yes, she was uh, uh, some kind of, she was, uh, had something to do with fun escrows. Escrow, yeah. yeah. Okay, real estate type. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, uh, I don't know. It's, I just could not be in that world. Yeah. 
I didn't, I didn't feel comfortable. I just seen him go around and look at things. And when he went around and he looked at something, they were suppressed after that. Hmm. And there was a file on it. Was this the, um, talking of money, wasn't this the same guy that um, he, he got into an argument with a guy with a bag of Krugerrands or? Yes. Yes. Oh, I saw something. Is that about the... Um... The gold magnets, right? Right, yeah. Anyway... In one yes. of these books, I saw something about He got that. into an argument with a guy that was a hot shot coin collector. And um, he said, bring your bag of coins. And the guy said, yeah, I'll bring the bag of coins, but you're not going to be able to pick them up. And John says, can I keep every coin that I pick up? And I remember him saying this to the guy when he walked through the door. He says, take a handful of cooter and just throw them out there on the ground. And I watched it. The guy took a handful and threw them out on the ground, and John said, that's not enough. And he took another, <laughs> and he threw some more out on the ground. And he went around with this portable device, and he just snatched them up. Just pop up to the machine and he put it in his pocket. Mine, right? Pretty soon he had all the coins on the floor and he said, would you like to try with the rest of the bag? The guy said, no. I'm just going to live up to my deal. So about how much is a could ride worth then? About 450 an ounce, I think. <laughs> Maybe $500, somewhere around there. But it didn't make any difference to John Sedega because it, it really wasn't the money. Right. I have his, uh, I don't know if Benini ever talked about, uh, his gold magnet. Oh yeah, yeah, he, he did mention that, yeah. I have it. You kidding? And it works. Huh. You don't pick gold up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's not like a traditional magnet. It works like that. Right. But it's got to do with resonance. It doesn't have to do with magnetism. Right, yeah. And, uh, or traditional magnetism. Right. But I did keep that. I found that and preserved it. This is actually a specialized magnet which you were talking about. And um, this was built by my brother and at one time had a wand attached to it. This is the bottom of the cabinet. But I guess it's exposed now since I was doing some work with it and I just left it like that. Um, the fact is, it does get very hot, and the cabinet it was in was too much for it. So we had to take the cabinet off of there. But it will pick up gold. It does have the problem of getting very hot, but uh, the other problem is that it seems to, if you're in the proximity of it for very long, you, you can get ill from it. And uh, I don't know if it's uh, doing something to the molecular structure of the blood, but that seemed what uh, uh, my brother thought. Now, and I, I, I couldn't disagree with him, and I cautioned him about using it in nature where you were exposing the microbes in yeah. uh, the environment to a uh, maybe altering factor which could change their genetic makeup. So, with you know, 99% of all. Uh, changes uh, that happen genetically are fatal to the species. Yeah. And so that's why I think he dropped it using that for that point. But well, there, was a, there was an attachment that went with it? Was there? there was a cabinet that went over the top and that had an uh, attachment that went in and hooked up to the magnet. Now I, I can't even tell you, there's some loops here that fit underneath here which I think was used, that's what was powering the wand. But, because you have the reverse side of this magnet that would work as, as good as this side. It's going to be both sides, you know. So, would, would, would that unit itself pick up the metal mm -hmm. or the wand or both? Both. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's simple. It's the configuration of the core. It's not a hollow core. So, it's not an air coil magnet. Electromagnet. It's this core, this 
tuned coil inside this coil is what makes it work. And of course the power that's going to it has to be a certain voltage. And that is those things are the two triggers that makes this work. What what kind of voltage does it? Does it's it, using seventy volts DC. Okay, P pulse or direct or direct. Just seventy volts yeah. DC. That's what I get this transformer here for. Right. And uh, just a simple transformer, and it it does work. Uh, I I guess I'm cautioning you about it because. I don't want to expose anybody to something that's highly experimental. But, right. But and, and you worked on this with uh, with John. Yeah, I worked on it with John, and uh, that's I mean he he showed me how he put it all together, yeah. and how he made it. Uh, so I was involved in that much of it. I didn't demonstrate it to the people that that maybe you might know about, but I saw it work, and I in fact used it here in the house. On myself, and I, and I must admit that I was sick for a while after using it. So um, I just hesitate using it at this point because we got to find out more about what it's doing. Where, where did you and John get the idea or the underlying principle behind this? How, how did how did that come about? Well, <laughs> John, he was always looking for enterprises, and he was actually uh, told about the possibility that this magnet could be built by a friend of his. And um, this friend, and I, and I can't use his name, he's still alive, I don't think he'd want me to use it, but um, this friend said that he uh, knew that it was possible to do and that somebody told him how to that should be this should be built in such a way, and John um, kind of built it as a challenge because he didn't think it would work, and it did work. So I, I don't know uh, why it works either, except that uh, uh, the magnetic principles in it are not truly magnetic. In other words, it's a resonating. Uh, magnetic field. And it produces quite a vibration, quite a hum to it. Um, I don't know, it's in its crude form here, and I think it could be refined quite a bit. Did, did he just have the one model? or th This is this it? Is the only model. Yeah. And this is just on there because, the, like I said, the cabinet's been removed, and it's just shielding the coil and the works underneath there. And it's nothing fancy, but uh, like I said, it was something that he built as a challenge to what this guy said. How, how long did it take to uh, to build it, to, to get the parts out of it? Well, I think that uh, he had a problem building it, um, not from the standpoint of the, of the functioning parts of it. It was the voltage. And the voltage on this mark is key to making this work. And... Uh, I can't seem, I've tried it uh, on all kinds of metals and it doesn't seem to work anything but gold. So, so by, by extrapolation, maybe if you change certain parameters it would pick up other metals or, or plas plastic? or. I, I believe that, yeah. yes I believe that, but there would have to be some changes that made in, the, right. core, in yeah. the core here, which he told me what he thought. Uh, would have to be done, yeah. Uh, and and I haven't done it. Uh, I just felt that uh, maybe it was a little touchy to do any more work on it, so I have, I've just left it like it has been. Yeah. And I I've, I've done a little tinkering down here with it, but I just didn't want to go any further. Yeah. You say making change changes in the core just. Ge generic terms, what, what kind of changes would make it move one way or another in terms of up or down the periodic table? Or Well, I, I don't know how much to go into it, but this core is not a solid core. Right. So it's segmented. And these segments that are in here are of the kind of metal that he found out would work. And secondly, of the right shape 
and uh, that's what the key is. Um, so I, I'm, you'd have to take it apart and put, and, and using the same psychology of what he, way he built it, put different corresponding segments in there uh, and with different lengths and different, uh, different metals, different kind of metals. It's and not gold that's in here, by the way. Right. <laughs> Is it a metal or an alloy? It's, it's a metal. metal. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it would just primarily be a matter of changing, playing yep. around with that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. What, was this built when he was in California or when you were both in California? or when... This was built in California. Yeah. Uh, this was built in California. And it wasn't when, I believe, uh, it was just prior to the time that I went out there. And um, he had it at his place of residence. Um, he had a shop that he worked on stuff, but he also, at his residence he also had a lab, and it was there that I saw originally in the in the case, uh, which he later removed because it was just too hot. Yeah. yeah. And uh, of course, it could be cooled, and there's ways to cool this magnet. There's no doubt about that. So that's that's not difficult. We just never went to that extent. So, and basically, you talked talked him out of pursuing it because of the, of the potential side effects. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just I explained to him, you know, what it possibly could be doing to his blood, and uh, uh, and then the possibility that, say, if you were say, to like the aspect, me and I talked about gold being present in ocean water. Now, it's dissolved and it's a molecular state. But, you might be able to pull gold out of ocean water. But, there's the other factor of what are you doing to the microbes in the water. You know, that's got, we got to find out more about it. Yeah. But, that's a tremendous source of gold. It's just plain ocean water. Yeah. So, yeah. That's one of the aspects we talked about. He was pretty interested. He had somebody interested in putting money into it. Yeah. But uh, he he decided later he just didn't want to pursue it. Yeah. No. So, but he he was interested in 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 gold anyway, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. it was. And of course, gold was <laughs> sixty dollars an ounce. Yeah. Now it's a thousand. So yeah. it might be a factor to consider. You know, through the right kind of research, maybe you could do it. You know, yeah. and, uh, the shielding that might it might take to do might be kind of expensive, but a uh, thousand dollars an ounce, you could probably pay for that pretty quick. So, what 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 exactly did did the wand look like? Was it was it metal or plastic or? I can't tell you, except that there I knew there was a a jack in the cabinet. That, that attached to. Right. And I, I can't tell you, I don't know. I yeah. never did see that one. Oh, okay. Yeah. When he got rid of the cabinet, I never saw the one. Yeah. So. You know, and, and, and John Sajaka always had these famous sayings, his little things like, you'd see that two countries would be fighting between each other, this country would be Christian, and this country would be Catholic, and, and he would say to me, he says, look, John, they drag their crosses into war, and they're fighting with the same God. He would say things like that, and uh, I kind of would look at him because I was brought up religious, you know, and I would say, well, wait a minute, you know, the guy... He's not really insulting anybody. He's just, he's just saying, "Onward, Christian soldier with a cross." Right. Right. And what are they fighting for? They're fighting this. It's the same God. My it's God's different. Yeah, God. my God's better than your God. And uh, it just blew me away about the things that he knew. He knew, he knew what was going to happen in the future before it happened. He would say. You know, you'd be driving along and he'd say, see the way those trees are shaped, John? He'd say, the energy's at the top. 
if you had a machine, you could catch it at the top. And pretty soon, after he gave you the geometric shape, you could see all through nature, right, that there was this geometric shape. And the, and the thing was growing beautifully. You know, mm -hmm. so he knew. And he he said to me, he says, you see that gold mine over there? We, we, we lived in California, so Placerita Canyon wasn't far away. And we once in a while we'd drive up Placerita Canyon and he'd say, see that? He said, you know, they buried all this gold underneath the freeway. There was a vein of it. They just buried it. Hmm. I said, well, how do you know that, John? He says, because I know. And so he said, there's little bugs that make this gold, John. He says, and you come back in 30 years and you'll strike gold again. Hmm. So, and then come to find out in all his stuff, I think you and I seen where it said these little bugs make gold. Right. Yeah. And so he checked everything out. But then you were something about the green gasoline that um, John, your brother, had. Yeah, I had some of it. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I had some of it, and it smelled like coal. Huh. And there's a, supposedly in Virginia, or, or where the coal mines are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was somebody that, and I can't remember, I'd have to go back to my stuff. But yeah. There was a, there was a little G German that got that green stuff from a Martian. Right. And it was made by coal. Hmm. And uh, yeah. from coal. And John got, the, the, he, I don't know how he found out about this guy, but he went to see him. And uh, he found out the guy had a process to take coal and refine it into a liquid. Right. And I saw pictures of it and formulas and stuff like that. Yeah. And I don't know, they, ne they never became my possession. Yeah. But, uh, and John, he tried like a lot, very hard to get hold of those formulas. And I don't know that he ever did. He, he was the only man that I ever knew that had one of everything. And he had a gigantic schoolhouse with file cabinets in it where all this stuff had been kept for years and years and years, suppression. And I think when when Tony was reading some things here, that he recognized some names and he knew they were spies and they were suppressors. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, um, in one of these things, Moray's mentioned, where Moray actually filled in the missing chemicals now, how did he get that? Well, so Jacob filled in the missing chemicals. Yeah. Yeah. Where did he get the information? Yeah. And he said, don't worry about that, John, when I asked about that. He says, we've made that a long time ago. And that's that's in one of these files that I was looking at. Yeah. Yeah, one of these. I see many of them now. Yeah, there's just tons of these. You know, different papers with Sir Jacob's writing on it where... He obviously went and checked it out, and if it was something that was really, truly workable and real, then it was suppressed. But this, we know that Walter Russell was for real because his books are out there. Yeah. And we know that uh, that John. But how did he get hold of these letters from Walter Russell well, to that's, Henry? That, well, he Mustard, he or? told me the story on this. He told me that he went to visit Walter Russell's wife. Oh, she must have given him to him. Right. It's very nice of her. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, and I mean, we're talking, you know, she was a beautiful girl. Mm -hmm. And, uh... You're saying he was a sweet talker? Well, he must have been a pretty darn good sweet talker <laughs> because he ended up with that file and nobody else has got that file. Right. I wasn't there for that meeting or uh, but he did tell me he had met with her and uh, I know she shared some things with him and uh, some of Russell's journals uh, of what he did but I don't have them. Nobody's ever seen that but it, I mean you can read it here 
uh, I think Tony was reading it here. If you just read a little bit of it, Pat, where it talks about, they, they say right in here, nature, you know, science is wrong. I think you were reading that, weren't you, earlier, Tony? Here's the third law, the first law. Yeah. New thermodynamics. First law, cold generates energy, heat radiates. Oh, cold generates energy, heat radiates energy. Cold multiplies, it cannot divide. It cannot divide. Heat divides, it cannot multiply. Second law, every reaction must be preceded by its equal action. Heat is the reaction of cold. Heat could not come into existence save for the compressive action of cold. The law of entropy, therefore, has no place in nature. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so, so they knew all this. Yeah. They knew all this. So they knew about time travel. They knew about how to generate powders for transmutation. They knew the missing chemicals to the moray tube. They knew about me. They knew about Reich, Reich's work. Um, these were people that must have gathered up information for years and years and years. Really? And so I think at some point in time, I think it would be fair to everybody if we'd make certain things yeah. available. John talked to me about uh, things that happened in Bedini's life right. that paralleled some of the things mm -hmm. that he went through. And yeah. uh, Brother John was aggressive and uh, very inquisitive. Um, I don't know exactly. I've never really met anybody like him. But Bedini would be as close. Between the nine kids in the family, Johnny and I were the closest. Uh, and we shared a lot of things. But um, he was 18 years older, and so he was, he was down the road quite a bit from where I was. So. John had a series of strokes, and uh, he finally became pretty disabled. Yeah. And uh, he, it was one thing he valued very much was his mind, and he was very worried about not being able to be the person he was. I took his ashes up the top of the hill, and there was no wind. The minute I dumped the ashes up, they come right up in my face. So. Figured maybe he didn't want to be there, but he was going to be there regardless. <laughs> yeah. Corn, as you know, is a, uh, a vegetable that was imported from the Caribbean up here. Uh, it was originally discovered in uh, Haiti, I think. But corn, uh, being a tropical plant like that, we have to plant seed in the spring, and of course, they grow amazingly fast. And uh, by July, August is six or seven feet tall, or maybe eight feet tall. But it grows so fast, and those, the cells of the corn expand at such a, and multiply at such a great rate, and it pushes up from the center. It's like as a swirl, and it pushes up through there as it slips through the sections that are already completed the new section will make a squeaking sound and you can actually hear that in the field each plant is growing at a different rate at a different stage you know so it you could almost maybe put a tune together but uh, it'll be a solid amount of squeaking going on all the time like uh, a swing might make a squeaking sound like that